Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our ongoing uh, science sharing uh, webinar series in Central Region. Uh, today, uh, we're going to have a topic of all of our interest, I'm sure, at this time of year on uh, major ice storms in the central United States. Um, I'd like to turn it over to John Gagan to do the introductions. Uh, John, uh, go ahead. Thank you, John. Um, I appreciate everybody being uh, uh, I know we got some active weather out there. Um, so within the next hour here, we're going to have uh, both Chris Sanders and Chad Gravel uh, provide a presentation here. Uh, it's part of a Comet project that was started a couple years back with St. Louis, St. Louis University. Um, since that time, at the Topeka office, and Chad Gravel is, is working uh, at Central Region Headquarters, but as a liaison uh, with the Sims folks uh, working with uh, Gozar uh, in that project. Um, also, we have Dr. Graves on the line from St. Louis University, which was also a principal investigator. And, and through, the, through the hour here, if you have questions, both uh, Dr. Graves and myself will be available. Uh, but I want to make sure that uh, we, we hand this off to Chris and Chad for their, for their pre presentation here. They did uh, by far the lion's share of the work here. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and hand this off to Chris Sanders at Topeka. All right. Thanks, John. Um, uh, basically, yeah, John gave you the, the rundown of everything, and uh, this the research that you're going to see, some of the results that you're uh, going to see today was um, published in the uh, Operational Meteorology uh, this past July, and there's a link down there at the bottom uh, of this title page here. And we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, so starting with how we found the cases here, we basically dealt with NAR data set, uh, which goes from January 1979 to uh, March 2010. Uh, we, we were looking for ice storms, so anything uh, with accumulations of a quarter of an inch or greater, and uh, in and around the Springfield CWA and the surrounding CWAs, I have a map to show that. Uh, we utilized the uh, Cold Regions uh, Research and Engineering Laboratory uh, they do uh, some work uh, mapping out some of these ice storms, going back and, and looking at the past data. Also, obviously, using storm data from the NCDC and event archives from some of the uh, uh, local offices uh, of, of, the, of the recent years, some of the ice storms that have happened. And what we tried to do there was trying to find, uh, using uh, surface observations of freezing rain to determine a start, maximum coverage time, and end time, since we're doing a composite study here. Uh, and those are the three times that we're going to focus on um, throughout the project here. And uh, this is just a picture of the domain and the CWAs involved, like I said, in and around the, uh, the Springfield CWA being the center there. And we wanted a domain large enough to capture enough ice storms as well as uh, um, give us a good number to deal with uh, and do the composite study on. So how we selected the start time was whenever there were rain observations within the domain. So for this particular case in 2002, uh, you can see that there were, this is the first hour in which there were two or more, um, and that became the start time. Um, to kind of capture the mature phase of the ice storm, if you would call it that, we uh, call this the maximum coverage time, uh, and it was the the maximum number of freezing rain odds within the domain, so the first hour which that occurred in this case, uh, you can see that here. And then there were no freezing rain odds within the domain. So pretty simple, uh, the three times there that we did composites on. And this is kind of a, just to show the total amount of freezing rain observations for this particular case. It was uh, 39 hours from start to finish there. Uh, and you can decide, see how the the uh, ice swath, if you would call it that, across the domain. And this was pretty common among the events that we looked at. So we were able to find a total number of 51 events that had a quarter inch or more. The average uh, event duration was 34 hours. Uh, minimum was seven and maximum was 99. So with the seven hour one, that one clipped uh, sort of the edge of the domain, but uh, its characteristics were very similar, so it, it made it into the uh, composite. And the uh, maximum event there was 
99 hours. That, you can see some of these storms can last uh, several days. And the monthly distribution of all the events, uh, of the 51 events, most of them occur in January with 16, followed by December there with 14 and February. So just the, the heart of the uh, winter season there, and there's a few that occur in the early, early uh, part of the cool season and then even the late into March. Uh, to kind of classify some of these events, we use the orientation of the thermal gradient. So analyzing the 2 meter 32 degree isotherm orientation at the start time of each event uh, gave us 35, which had a southwest to northeast. That was the, the most common orientation at start time that were generally east to west, uh, and then six there that were northwest to southeast. So we obviously wanted to focus on the majority here, and that was this 35. Like I said, there were 51 events in the domain that had a quarter inch or more. Of those uh, events, there were 37 that had uh, three quarters of an inch, and we, we chose that as kind of a threshold. Uh, since we are focusing on major ice storms here, uh, we, we felt that a quarter inch, you're starting to get significant impacts at that point, um, if not at, even at earlier times, but that was just kind of a threshold we, we decided to choose there. And of the the uh, southwest to northeast cases, there were 24 that had three-quarter inch or more. So basically half of the total events uh, were some of these southwest to northeast major ice storms. Uh, but what, in, what in, ended up going into the composite was the um, 20 cases, because four after analyzing them were considered outliers, and a lot of that freezing rain was going, going on within the trial structure, and uh, that kind of wasn't the uh, typical setup that we, we saw with the results there. there. Uh, this is just sort of a list breaking down the uh, 20 events that went in the composite and the maximum ice accumulation found in the domain that occurred with that event. So you can see there's some big, big storms there. I'm sure some of those uh, are familiar with some of the losses out there. Move into the methodology of choosing the composite center point uh, after some Analysis, we found that the what seemed to be most consistent was using the, the axis of the low-level moisture, and that was done by analyzing the 850 millibar mixing ratios, and that's in green here. Uh, so you can see the, the higher values centered here, maybe in the western Gulf, uh, eastern Texas there, and that axis uh, travels north into Oklahoma and Kansas there. And where that intersects the... 2 meter 32 degree isotherm became the composite center. And for, di for this particular case, that's where the uh, red dot is there, the crosshair. So we did that for start, max, and end times, and all the composite results were done off that. So I'll move into the results here. It's looking at the uh, sea level pressure and the 32 degree isotherm there at 2 meters, uh, you can see an expansive high pressure over the northern plains, upper Midwest, that has moved into the center part of the country here. The 32 degree isotherm uh, basically intersects the uh, domain here from the southwest, basically along the I-44 corridor there. And uh, the red star represents the average of all the composite start locations. And uh, most of the uh, most of the domain, the northern part of the domain, is under a north to northeast winds. And there's a surface trough here, which extends from southeast Texas into the Tennessee River Valley there. And um, that's associated with a boundary uh, that has moved through the area and is, is quasi-stationary at this point. Um, but most of the domain, half of the domain now is in the, the Subarctic subfreezing air, I'm sorry, the subfreezing air associated with the Arctic air mass with this high pressure. Moving into the max coverage time, you can see the high pressure has uh, just drifted to the south slightly, but uh, basically over the same area. Uh, the winds have slightly increased here from 5 to uh, widespread 10 knots there that you see across a lot of the northern part of the domain. And the uh, surface boundary still kind of remains uh, quasi-stationary over the mid-south into the Tennessee River Valley. Uh, and the composite center now has shifted to the south, uh, slightly to the west there, because the moisture has been 
beginning to work its way up. You'll see that in the next couple slides. Um, and the 32 degree isotherm has, has progressed to the southeast as well, to the south. Moving into the end time, you can see cyclogenesis is starting to take place, uh, and you'll see why that is occurring. But let's see a lot of low pressure here developing across Mississippi. Uh, 32 degree isotherm has moved you know, ever so slightly to the south there, but the composite center now has worked its way into southern Indiana there, and um, most of that moisture and all that's working its way off to the east, and um, your high pressure to the north is, is starting to weaken there across the uh, northern plains. This is looking at 850 uh, winds at isotax and uh, heights. There's kind of a, a broad trough extended across the central plains, uh, but basically a south to southwest flow over most of the domain. And there's beginnings of a, a what seems to be a low-level jet beginning to form across parts of eastern Texas and uh, Oklahoma and Arkansas there. At maximum coverage time, the trough has maybe moved off to the east. Um, and uh, you can see that the low-level jet has intensified and in increased in coverage. Um, we're looking at maybe a 30, 25 to 30 knot low-level jet basically over the southern southeast part of the domain there, uh, but stretching into some of the um, areas of interest that we'll see. And at the end time, the trough has, has deepened and is making its way through the Mississippi River Valley and the, the low-level jet has also increased in coverage and intensity again, furthermore, but it's moved off um, basically east of the domain or eastern part of the domain at this point. This is analyzing uh, 500 millibar heights and vorticity. Vorticity field obviously kind of gets averaged out in the end um, since each case is variable with that. But um, you can see that the main Main uh, long wave trough is centered across the western conus here, and uh, the southwest flow uh, is, is over most of the domain there. And at uh, the uh, maximum coverage time, there's maybe evidence of a lead short wave that's kicking out uh, of the main energy into the central part of the U.S., uh, and that can maybe imply that maybe see several rounds of enhanced uh, vertical lift with these events and you might get multiple rounds of precipitation with those as as the main system hangs off across the western conus there until that kicks out and it's it's been seen you know, several short waves could possibly come off uh, and, and move over the area enhancing the lift but southwest flow remains across the domain there by the end time you can see the main trough is now kicked out into the central plains and is is moving off to the east, and that's probably why the cyclogenesis is starting to take place here across the Mid-South. Uh, you see that low pressure that began to develop along the frontal boundary there as things kick off to the east. This is 300 heights in isotax as well as divergence, another field that kind of gets averaged out, but it shows up here a little bit. Uh, the main long way trough is in the same location as the 500 heights. And uh, you can see a pretty good upper level jet anchored over the uh, Great Lakes region there, uh, extending down into the domain. And uh, that place is basically the large uh, part of the domain in the uh, right entrance region, which is good for upper, upper vertical motion there with the uh, upper level divergence. By the uh, maximum coverage time, the low level or upper level jet, sorry, has increased in intensity there, and there's maybe evidence that possibly back builds back into the domain, you know, associated with the diabetic heating processes going on with the precipitation, and you can see the divergence field is actually showing some values, composite values showing up here across the center part of the domain there, uh, but the uh, the right entrance region is still hanging tough here, um, su supplying the uh, vertical lift there, enhancing that. And by the end time, it's increased, uh, again, the upper level jet speeds and the um, right entrance region is now moving off east of the domain there as the main trough kicks out again 
as seen in 500 heights there. Focusing a little more on the composite max uh, coverage time here, uh, this is looking at two meter temperature reduction centered around the, the max time. And you can see the our main focus here is going to be um, you know, what's going to keep the sub-freezing surface layer uh, from, from warming and keeping the freezing rain ongoing. Uh, you can see some of these events are longer duration, so there's something that processes that need to be going on to um, keep the uh, sub-freezing surface temps there. And you can see there, there is some cold air advection taking place on the north side of the 32 degree isotherm of interest. You also look at wet bulb advection. You know, if you, if you have a saturated layer, you've got rain going on, uh, if you want to cool that layer, keep it cool. Uh, you're advecting dry air in, and that's going to cool the layer. Uh, and that seems to be uh, taking place here. There's some, some value showing up on the north side of the, the freezing line here. And, uh, you know, that's going to help offset some of the latent heat released um, during the process of accreting the ice. So that helps maybe keep the uh, storms ongoing. So dry air advection, cold air advection, both taking place. Looking more at the 850, uh, what's going on with the elevated warm layer? There's, uh, this is warm air advection, temperature advection, sorry, it ends up being warm air advection uh, across basically the southern uh, part of the domain, stretching into the area of interest where we're probably going to see some freezing rain. So you do have the warm temps that are making their way into that. We'll analyze that further. This is actually looking at the maximal temperature in, between the surface and 500 millibars. And you're, you're getting into temps that are well above what past research has shown uh, around 3 degrees C or greater to completely melt the uh, ice crystals falling into that layer. And uh, your, your 3 degree um, isotherm or max temp would be right around here, uh, which places most of the, this area of interest um, well within the, the values that are needed to melt the ice crystals falling into that layer, getting around 6 degrees C. And this is an average around the, com the max coverage time. Where that max uh, temp takes place is around the 850, 825 millibars in this region. So that's an area to look at, and that was evident in there. The low-level jet, the warm air advection taking place that layer, it's not surprising that's where it is. Focusing on the uh, mixing ratios at 850 and mo uh, moisture transport vectors, you can see the, uh, the low-level moisture axis, which has come up from the western gulf there, and the uh, implied moisture convergence taking place uh, right in this area, which is uh, where the freezing rain is occurring. You have the uh, warm, elevated uh, temperatures as well as the sub-freezing surface layer, and precipitation is probably... Uh, breaking out across this region. And we'll see that in this cross-section here, uh, which just goes from uh, eastern Kansas down to Louisiana, uh, so from northwest to southeast, and the red is the isotherms. Uh, green shading is uh, relative humidity with respect to water. The blue shading is relative humidity with respect to ice, and the brown is the omega, and uh, blue arrows are the ageostropic wind. Uh, so right off the bat, you can see the uh, elevated warm layer uh, stretching across the sub-freezing surface layer at the surface. So you have a pretty good area uh, where you're getting mixed precipitation uh, in this region. Uh, it's well saturated with high RH values um, working their way in from the south. Uh, you can see a large area of, of vertical motion here taking place over the area of interest where the freezing rain is occurring. So there's pretty good lift associated with uh, you know, isentropic lift with the uh, 850 low-level jet as well as the upper-level divergence with the upper-level uh, right, uh, jet streak right entrance region. So you're getting plenty of lift, precipitation ongoing. Uh, you're saturated up up through the column, and, and we'll see that in, a, in the um, uh, sounding here, composite sounding. Uh, Agiotropic winds show the, the, the circulation convergence with the uh, around the front, frontal zone and that upper level divergence there. This is a similar cross section but looking at uh, theta and you can basically the thing to point out here is that 294 uh, temperature works its way right through the elevated warm layer so we decided to do an analysis on that 
Um, so this is the mean pressure on that uh, theta surface. You can see it originates there uh, at the surface in the uh, gulf there and slowly uh, travels north, ascending to around the 850 millibars where the, uh, the uh, with associated with the low-level jet elevated warm layer. So this, the air that you're seeing in the elevated warm layer is probably originating near the gulf and so the warm moist air is working its way up uh, above the uh, sub-freezing surface layer looking at the moisture values and, and the mixing ratios associated with that, that theta, you can see values of 14 grams per kilogram in the source region here, uh, very moist air working its way over that frontal zone. And uh, uh, another thing to note here, which is uh, interesting, is the drier air mass analyzing the streamlines. Uh, that kind of works its way along the northwest side of the, uh, the uh, domain there which probably implies you probably have a pretty sharp cutoff in some of these events with the precipitation on the north side. This composite sounding was taken at the maximum coverage time uh, around the area of uh, Fayetteville, Arkansas, the northwest Arkansas area, which was pretty close to the, the composite center point. Uh, it's a typical sounding that you'll see with these events. You have your sub-freezing surface layer in the coldest temperature in that layer is usually not at the surface, it's usually elevated a little bit, and some of the research has shown that. And you can see that in the sounding. Uh, and then as you work your way up the column, you can see the uh, elevated warm layer, uh, which has a max temp around 6 degrees C, located at 844 millibars. And this elevated warm layer is about 221 millibars deep. And the column is pretty much saturated um, as, as you um, travel aloft. So, and then analyzing the winds, a typical north to northeast wind uh, at the surface, quickly veering to the uh, south and southwest uh, as you work your way into the elevated warm layer. Another thing we were able to do is probabilities based on the, the 20 composite events. Uh, and this is kind of a combination of looking at uh, a max uh, temperature in the elevated warm layer of a one degree C or greater, and a surface temp below 32. Uh, and most of the 80% of the events uh, in this area had that criteria met. So there's most likely a mixed precipitation going on with most of these events uh, as you have some, some partial melting and, and full melting occurring. And we'll look at that similar here. The only thing different is this is the looking at a max temp above three degrees C and the surface below freezing. And that really highlights the area expected where you're most likely going to see freezing rain uh, given these typical setups. And uh, that's basically north, just north and northeast of the uh, composite center point here located uh, on the Arkansas and uh, Oklahoma border. Uh, but you can see how, how, that, how the uh, structure is and, and what the coverage is of these freezing rain events. Uh, that'll kind of help with preparing for, for these. Another thing to look at is how long freezing rain occurred at each uh, observation site. So we're able to do probabilities of eight, eight hours of freezing rain or more. And this is just at one location there. Um, there's an 80% chance of seeing uh, eight hours of freezing rain with these events. And that's pretty, pretty um, pretty staggering if you think about it, even with light precipitation, you're gonna that's why uh these events are able to cruise uh three quarter inch or more of uh ice. So I think the main thing to even if you have light precipitation with these efficient ice accretion, but over a long duration is why these events are so bad. Uh, and as long as that main trough is hanging out to the west, uh you know you have maybe piece of it, uh, of energy working their way across, but as long as as long as that thing hangs out to the west is probably delegates how long you have freezing rain. Uh, but you can see with these events that's pretty common. And even looking at the probability of 10 hours or more um, in the shading there, you have 70% contour just to the north and northeast. Um, and like I said, this is all relative to the composite center point. Just to kind of sum everything up with a little conceptual model at the max coverage time, um, the high pressure at the surface, uh, your, your trough out to the west and the main trough, upper-level jet streak, low-level jet streak there, 
and the area of freezing rain in pink, uh, the yellow represents the three degree C elevated warm layer uh, temps there, and the green dashed is your uh, low level uh, moisture access, analyzing the mixing ratios, which are solid green, and then you have your your quasi-stationary front here located to the south. This kind of sums up everything, and these are all locations relative to the max coverage um, time and location, which is here. So something maybe you can analyze when you're looking at a forecast. Um, I know all the locations right now are relative to the results of this, but if you shift this around relative to your area, depending on the forecast, this kind of helps you maybe judge what's going on uh, in a complete picture. I go. I think that's basically it. We can work our way into any questions at this point. No questions. Any questions uh, for the first half? Okay, I will turn it over to Chad at this point. Okay, can you guys see my screen all right? Yes, Got yeah, it looks good. Okay, great. Okay, so so Chris presented obviously a composite approach to finding the characteristics of, of these ice storms, and it's one way to use historical events um, in the in the forecast process. So although it's not, can you speak um, up, please? Sorry, say that again. Could you speak up? Yeah, sure. This this phone is awful in here. Um, so th this is one way you can use uh, historical events in the forecast process, the way Chris approached it, um, using composite analysis. Obviously, that's research. Um, but we can use those re results to actually identify these events in real time. Another way we can use these for, uh, historical events is to compare model output um, to them in, in this analog approach that many of you are aware of um, and have been using um, with, the, with the SIPS analog guidance. And I'll just give a little background and then I'll actually, I'll actually use one of the last major ice storms we've had and take a look at what that guidance would have looked like in a post-mortem sense. So just a little history on, on the analog guidance. It began in 2008 after science meetings between Springfield and St. Louis CWAs. Um, it, it started with cold season guidance and then expanded to the warm season. It's completely a grassroots movement, so there's no funding that has ever been given to this project. Um, and then one of the biggies, since November of 2009, the analog guidance has been mentioned in over 650 AFDs by over almost half of, of the WFOs in the CONUS. So you can see that, um, you know, even though that this project has never been funded, there's obviously a need, um, you know, for this type of information um, in the forecast process. So why do we do this? Why historical analog? Well, really the answer is something that was in the Weather Ready Nation and NWS strategic plan. And really we need to focus a shift in the way that we forecast and, pro and warn to provide these impact-based decision support services. But that's pretty difficult to do, especially with traditional model output. And even the most experienced forecasters have a hard time at, have a hard time at extracting that information from model output. So we can use these historical events as, you know, to our advantage. And I give one example down, down at the bottom. Um, you can see those two events along the East Coast are very similar. Are they identical? Well, absolutely not. But you can see that you can, be, you can pull the impact information from those two events leading up to the event. 
So how do we do that? Well, we use NCDC storm data, we use co-op data, precipitation data, severe storm reports, et cetera. Um, and another thing that you can do with this information is you can provide historical framework um, through in the forecast and by communicating with partners. So communicating the potential impact by referencing a past event. Nobody knows these events better than emergency managers who who've lived through them. And, and as soon as you start mentioning these events, it really raises a red flag, especially if it's a high impact event. And then finally, one of the last bullets I have down there is imagine overlaying this data with, with on in infrastructure maps and GIS, et cetera. We can't do that yet, but, but th this is definitely a way that we can kind of proceed in the future. So what about another way that, that the historical events can help in the forecast process is, is through forecaster decision assistance. So we have a clim conditional climatology of the forecast. So given the selection criteria of an analog, this is what typically happens. We have that model output. We have the 60-hour forecast. What do the historical events look like that are similar to that event, and then what happened in those historical events? And it provides situational awareness of these events, and then the forecaster can risk the potential impact. And it really assists forecasters in identifying high impact events and extreme events. And this is another statement that was in the uh, Weather Radar Nation Roadmap. So how do we do that? Well, I'm not going to go through this slide in detail um, because obviously it, w it would just take too much time. But we basically searched the 32-year North American regional reanalysis data set. We based on the large scale patterns, we find similar events. And then we take that information, and then we develop products that are based on, on those most similar events. And the, the events that we're talking about are the top 0.15% of events. So they're really the, 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 the top, very most similar events. And then some of the guidance that we, we can create, we can create analysis guidance. We use this to see how representative these historical events are to the forecast. If we deem that they are representative, then we kind of can, can give more weight to the impact guidance. And then if, if we want to find out some of the very most similar historical events of the top 15, then we can kind of take a look at those in the thumbnail guidance. And I'll give a brief kind of way that we can do that with, the, with this ice storm. And then finally, just a, a couple things to remember before I kind of take a look at this case is that, one, a perfect analog does not exist. But we can still have, we can still pull meaningful information from these historical events. Um, some of the meteorological data um, is only available back to 1975, and then if, the further you go back, especially with NCDC storm data, you know the quality of that data deteriorates in time. Um, only a few good quality analogs may exist for anomalous and record-breaking events. Um, and then some of the other things are um, some meteorological patterns are just obviously more predictable and easier to identify than others. So these are just a few things to remember when you're using this information um, in real time. So can you guys see this map okay? I'm, I'm pretty sure that you can. Um, but this is the case that we're going to use. It, it's basically the last major ice storm that hit um, southern and central region, it was uh, January of 2009. And here are the 48-hour freezing rain reports. And you can see there's, there's a pretty good swath of freezing rain. And this was one of the cases that was, w was included in Chris's composite analysis. But really, the core of, of the most impactful, greater than one inch or greater um, destructive area of, of ice was basically from Oklahoma City um, almost to, to Louisville there. So it was basically along this corridor. And then here is the snow that, that, at least early on, at the time we're looking at this event, you can see that there wasn't really a major heavy snow threat, but there was um, a good two to four inch band that, that occurred from 
uh, Nebraska through northern Missouri in the, into central um, central Illinois there. So this is basically what you get when you, when you kind of go to the website, but um, I'm, we're going to take a look at some of the products um, and not go into the details of this um, right now, just on, on base of time. So if we take a look at the, so here's the 300 height forecast um, that would, that is in red. This is the GFS 36 hour forecast that we're, that we found these, these most similar historical events with. And in the black is, is just the average of those top 15 events in, in, in black. And you can see that the long wave trough um, exists um, much in like the, the ice storm composite um, along the, the west coast and the Rockies. And then we have more zonal, uh, maybe southwest to northeast flow across the central U.S. And as we kind of work down, work our way down, you can see that the 500 heights are very similar. Um, 850 height, um, you have southwest, south flow, um, but really no organized system. Even in the forecast, there's a, there's a weak low over the southern Rockies. You can see that there's a trough that exists with the mean of those top 15 historical events. But, but the real key here is you can see that both agree um, quite a bit on, on the, the extent of that Arctic high. And, and that is obviously a key with, the, with these ice storms. You can see that the GFS, which is in red, had a large area of, of high pressure um, from, the, from the northern Great Plains into the Great Lakes area. And you can see the mean of those top 15 events were very similar. Um, you know, they, they almost, they had really good agreement on, on the placement of this high. Um, also on the, on, the, on the placement of the weak low pressure um, in, in, in the southern Rockies, and then maybe an inverted trough signal as well in, in both. So you can kind of give an idea of the representative of these top 15 analogs um, by looking at this information. If we take a look at some of the temperature guidance, this is also obviously a, a pretty big key when looking at um, an ice storm threat or a freezing rain threat. Um, and obviously we're only looking, we're only going to be looking at a couple layers and soundings would be better, but you can see that the zero degree isotherm at 850 um, is, is very similar. Basically the GFS forecast in the top 15 events, um, they, they almost line up on top of each other. And if we go down to the surface, you can see that the 32 degree isotherms are also very similar. They're oriented southwest um, or west southwest to east northeast. Um, and you can see that there's, um, they're, in, they're in a very similar spot from Oklahoma, southern Missouri into Kentucky. So by looking at this information, we can now have confidence that the, the impact guidance that, that we can create based on these top 15 events would, would be useful. So the best thing to do is kind of go take a look at that. And there's, there's a lot of things that you can look at here, and I won't go into all of them, but one of the first things are, you can see that there was a, there was a weak signal for snow, which is what we kind of expected. And you can see it's pretty similar. Maybe it's a little further south um, that what, what actually happened, um, that two to four inch band was, was a little further um, to the north um, in this event um, than, than what, the, what the guidance is providing. But if we take a look at some of the probability guidance, you can see that the probability of co-op snowfall greater than two inches, there's a good signal there, but then as we go up to four inches, that signal almost vanishes. That's a, that's a telltale sign that, um, you know, the historical events at least are, are suggesting that you're not gonna get heavy snow with, the, with this setup. And that's something that we, that we, already, that we already know. Um, if we go down and take a look at some of the freezing rain guidance that we have, um, we have, we have three products. Um, the probability of freezing rain um, greater than one hour, greater than three hours, and greater than six hours. And these greater than three hours and six hours are additions to give the threat um, of are these historical events providing a signal that is for long lasting freezing rain. And if we go through those, you can see that the, the greater than one hour um, probabilities are, are pretty high, especially from, from Oklahoma City to Springfield, Missouri, and then they taper off a bit 
um, to the to the north um, to the to the east northeast. Obviously, we're focused. Um, we're using model input that is focused on this time in this area. But the guidance, the the historical data that's going into this is a 48-hour historical of it, um, data. It, the idea behind that is to just kind of give the potential of an event downstream, even though you're not looking at that model guidance per se. If we were looking at this in real time, you would want to focus on probably uh, model forecasts that are a little further along, maybe the 48-hour forecast. But you can see that the signal is very high for one hour freezing rain. At least the probabilities are, are, are very high. If we go up, you can see that that signal still exists for greater than three hours at a location. And then if we look at the probabilities for six hours or more of freezing rain at an at a ob site, you can see that there's a very good signal. Obviously, as you increase in hours, your probabilities will decrease, but low probabilities are a screaming signal of the threat of these events. So you can kind of see, this gives an idea of an overview of how we would kind of approach this um, guidance um, in, with an ice storm or a freezing rain threat. But now we can kind of take a look at these individual events. And this is one way to um, kind of pick out what individual events are potentially the most similar. Um, and if by looking at the 850 height maps, the one I'm going to kind of pull out is this, this event from February of 2008. And you can see that the synoptic scale, so here's the GFS forecast, and then if we compare that to, um, to, the, to this historical analog, you can see that the setup is pretty similar. Large high per pressure at the surface, inverted trough um, extending from central Texas into the um, into the mid-Mississippi River Valley. At 850, you have a low-level jet. You can see that that's present. Um, you have a long wave trough at 500, and then you have some, some upper-level jet support as well. Um, that's where these probably, these analogs, um, they, they kind of differ the most at 300. But, you know, that, that's up to the forecaster to determine if, if that's going to be, um, uh, you know, if that's, if that's important or not. You know that that's not up to the to the to the historical events to determine. So another thing that we can look at is obviously temperature fields, which are which are very critical. Um, you can see that in the analog, the the 32 degree isotherm lines up from Oklahoma City um, into northern Tennessee. That's that's very similar in the forecast. And then at 850, the GFS forecast doesn't have this this sprawling warm nose. But, but, but the analog does. It has a four degree C warm nose, four to six degrees, four to six degrees C actually above where you have sub freezing temperatures. Obviously, you know the forecaster can determine if you know the, the synoptic setup is similar. You have a similar low level jet. Well, maybe the GFS isn't just han isn't handling the warm nose as, as well as it should. As I said before, that's for the forecaster to determine. But as we, as we look at these individual analogs, you could also look at the, these impacts. And you could take a look at the freezing rain that occurred with this analog. And you can see that there was a large expansive area of freezing rain from central Oklahoma um, into um, the Louisville area, very similar to what happened with this event. Um, another thing you can do by looking at these individual analogs is take a look at the NCDC uh, storm impact guidance. Um, and then if we take a look at it, we look at Missouri, you can see obviously, you know, there were there was many ice storm mentions. Uh, you can pull out impacts. Obviously, this data is only as good as uh, what the forecaster put into it at that time. Um, but uh, you can see that the power of, of using these historical events in real time. So this just kind of gives away, uh, you know, Chris and I presented two ways of how um, historical events could be used in the process, forecast process. Obviously, Chris used his for research and then using those conceptual models to identify these events in real time and then using model output to find historical events that are similar and pull out impacts. You can see how they could both be beneficial in the forecast process. So we have some time 
that we could um, potentially take some questions um, and I'd be more than happy to um, answer anything more about the, the analog guidance um, right now or Chris's presentation as well. If you have any questions, uh, please uh, just go ahead and uh, ask them at this point. Hey, this is Steve Ammerman in Tulsa, and uh, John, maybe you can address this too, or somebody. Um, just a basic question about how we define ice, an ice storm. Um, I, we've been looking at it down here, and we look at radial ice on a on a limb or on a and that kind of thing, but sorry, I ran somebody off. Um, but I think what we typically do is if we think there's a quarter of an inch of precipitation going to fall and, and we think it's all going to freeze, then we call it that. But that quarter of inch of precipitation will have a different radial ice thickness on different objects. Is, do you have or have you been looking at a specific definition or more specific definition for ice? Hi, Steve. This is John. Um, I think when it comes to the uh, the composite uh, study that we did, uh, I think one of the fortunate things we did is we we focused on the term you know having greater or equal to three quarters of an inch of ice. The reason being is I think what you're alluding to is that you know when it comes to measuring, um, usually what you're getting on lines, trees, uh, elevated surfaces is going to be, you know, a, a, a decent percentage less than what you'd get on a flat surface. Uh, so in these cases, uh, I think, you know, looking at storm data, looking at some of the, the data sets that are out there that, that show what have been major storms, you know, there's really been no, when you go back and look at these things, there's no, you don't know what they measured. You don't know if it was flat. You don't know if it was on the power lines. You don't know where they did it. Uh, there, there's been no uniform definition of that going back 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Obviously, nowadays, we're, especially what you mentioned there is a question that's been asked in the Central Region uh, over the past couple months, you know, what should we be providing? So I think by, we ended up benefiting ourselves by focusing on those major events because we full well know that probably on those events where they had three-quarters of an inch or greater mentioned in storm data or mentioned in the data set, there was probably less on the lines and less on the elevated objects, but it's just there's no historical record of that. Uh, so I think your point is well taken that you know, when we talk about three-quarters of an inch in ice, uh, it's, it's what three-quarters of an inch? Is it radial? Is it diameter? Is it flat surface? Um, and I, I think and the fortunate thing is when focusing on these major ice storms, we know that there was at least a decent amount on the power lines to have an impact. And a lot of these storms are ones that ended up with not only power outages, but power outages for days, infrastructure problems for days. Um, so hopefully going forward, what we can get is some sort of a, a unified uh, uh, um, uh, vision of, of how we forecast ice. Uh, and, and, you know, again, it, that does depend on customer. You know, the radial ice being a, a decent percentage less than what actually falls on a flat surface, that's something we're going to have to try and show and something that we're going to have to try and explicitly explain. Does that hopefully answer your, your question there, Steve? Uh, yeah, yeah, it, it does. Uh, it sounds like you're wrestling with the same thing we are, and maybe, maybe the Weather Service can come up with a pretty specific definition one day and and it'll help right. research. Right, because when you look at it, there's there's really four things going on. There's there's the radial ice that affects the power lines. There's the diameter, which we measure. Uh, then the forecaster, uh, and I'll, I'll go generally, generally speaking here, is probably doing something more of a one-to-one -one ratio rather than a percentage which radial or diameter would end up being. But then there's, you know, what we're putting in NDFD, which is, I think supposed to be a hybrid. So there's actually four individual different things going on when we talk about ice. So when we say ice, it's which ice? Yeah. Yeah. And if the wind's blowing very hard, you can accumulate a lot more ice with oh, the Oh, absolutely. Of rain. That's exactly right. 
you know, you've, you've also got the, you know, uh, and, and one of the things that Chris mentioned in the, in the, um, uh, in his portion of the presentation, you get something that has a very long duration, uh, especially with lighter hourly rates. That's also going to pile up pretty quickly too. Yeah, we have a, we use a GFE tool where we uh, allow the rain to accumulate as ice at higher and higher rates as the temperature gets colder uh, in our in our forecast grids. And uh, did you? Is anybody else working on that? Do you know? Or well, is, I see if is Kim Runk on the line. Yeah, I'm here. Kim, did you want to comment on this? Um, the specific question is, what what is it we're working? Yeah, what, I heard. Yeah, what we on as far as a tool for GFE uh, for forecast purposes. Yeah. Well, uh, what what we hope to d accomplish this year, um, we're sort of in the process of negotiating uh, with the regional unions, uh, Stewart. So um, this is all pre-decisional. But uh, I convened a, a small, quick turnaround team that uh, Dan Baumgart in uh, La Crosse agreed to lead, and it was composed of a, a set of some WCMs and SUs, and they sort of explored some some different options and some of the science to try and just bring a better balance between science and service to this forecast challenge, and uh, and to acknowledge that we we have some improvement to make because the method we currently use is pretty much just use flat ice, and uh, while that is is representative for you know what falls on a horizontal surface, the the, genu the the real impact comes with, uh, especially with power lines and tree branches and that sort of thing, with uh, a, a, a more of the radial ice uh, or some blend. And so they kind of recommended some algorithms that are based on the simple method that you may be familiar with in peer-reviewed um, articles over the last few years. And so uh, there is a, uh, a GFE sort of, you know, plug-in, uh, tool available that's being that's been worked on, and what we hope to do is have, at the very least, we will have a subset of central region offices install and use that. It will probably load the ice accum grid with the default flat ice, uh, so that essentially there's no workload. But forecasters, you know, will also have a procedure that's run behind the scenes, so they have another an alternate method to evaluate and collaborate on uh, we would like to I'd like to really have every office east of the Rockies install that uh, because at the very least we have an additional tool to collaborate with and uh, we will also have data sets to evaluate um, after the season is over you know and and look at actual storm cases and and uh, sort of verify and and get something a little bit more objective about what might be a more prudent approach. So um, that's that's where we are and what we hope to accomplish. We we had actually hoped to already have this negotiation worked out, but we lost about uh, you know two and a half weeks of progress during the shutdown. Uh, there's also a West case that's been developed by uh, Phil Schumacher and, and in uh, Sioux Falls and um, I think Andy Just in Lacrosse. And uh, so that will also be distributed as a West case that incorporates both both these ICE uh, tools, procedures, as well as the probability of weather type grid um, in the process. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's, uh, that's good in there. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry to put you on the spot there, Kim. I'll take my lumps. No, that's OK. okay. Did anybody else have any questions? We have uh, both Chad, Chris, Dr. Graves, and myself available. Yeah, I'll just chime in, John. This is Chris. Uh, going, uh, Looking at some of the peer-reviewed research, the simple models, stuff like that, looks like theoretically uh, flat uh, radial surface is about one-third the percentage of flat surface when you look at ice accumulations. That's some of the stuff come from Jones who came up with the simple equation there. So something to this keep in mind in the back of your head. Uh, like I said, radial ice is about one third of, of flat ice when you look at uh, accumulations. Obviously, the wind and different shapes and stuff can affect that, but 
they were they were looking at that measuring the ice and looking at radial thicknesses that are uniform Any, anybody else have any questions? Hey guys, this is Mike up in Aberdeen. Hi Mike. How's it going, John? Uh, uh, good doing good, sir. Yeah, this is a great presentation. I think it uh, definitely confirms a lot of the, the research that's been out there. But one question I have, and in, in South Dakota, admittedly we're kind of on the northern edge of the main ice storm climatology, but I think one of the issues forecasters always are challenged with with these events is the difference between whether it's going to be freezing rain or sleet. And I'm curious if you ran any sort of composite with the difference between, you know, an ice storm versus a sleet storm, so to speak. And I'm, I'm assuming it probably has to do with the strength of the, the uh, low-level cold air advection or maybe the strength of the anticyclone. Um, but I, I think that would be something that might be useful. I don't know if there's enough of a signal there. Maybe it, that's within the realm of the noise. I'm not sure. But I'd be curious if you guys looked at anything with that. We didn't composite anything based on that, but we did look at probabilities of sleet reports within the observations, and we were getting around maximum coverage time probabilities around 40% with these cases. Uh, so 40% of these cases had sleet uh, within them. I, w I would imagine even some of them have, you know, depending on the event, yeah. But we didn't look at anything as far as compositing the different scenarios between a, a heavy sleet event and a heavy freezing rain event. As far as yeah, and, and one of the Achilles heels with trying to composite something like that, Mike, is the really you really need a, an excellent vertical resolution uh, because a lot of this is happening in the lowest you know 150 millibars uh, of the atmosphere, going from the warm nose on down, and usually. You know your your cold your cold dome is so shallow, you know on the order of you know you know, you know hundreds of feet, uh, you know in some cases especially on the leading edge, yeah. So really, I don't know if there's a way to cleanly composite that given the lack of vertical resolution. But there, there's no doubt about it. You know, it, it, if you you get into these situations on the northwest side, and just speaking from experience, you know down here in Springfield where you know, we don't have an event that isn't isn't mixed. There's there's usually uh, multiple uh, phases of precip going on. Uh, you know, trying to find that flash freeze point uh, in the lowest uh, in the lowest few you know hundred feet of the atmosphere is is what's absolutely critical. You know, going back to the top down method there, yeah, you know, that's that's probably the thing that we rely on the most is is just trying to find you know where where that flash freeze point would would happen. Um, but I, again, without without having great vertical resolution, uh, it's almost you know it's it's almost just going to always be smoothed. I don't know, Dr. Graves, Chad, you want to comment on that? Yeah, I I mean, this is Chad. I agree. Um, it would it would be it would be difficult um, if if all these cases had sleep because some of them I think some of those events that went into the composite did not have sleet um, you know we we could do that I mean I, we could easily you know compare composite sounding every 25 kilometers to the to the north of, of where the you know where the heaviest freezing rain occurred. Um, you know, I mean, I, I don't see why we couldn't do that, but it, it it is challenging, and I don't know if, you know, the NAR is like it's 25 millibars, and it, there's 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 guidance out there that's obviously better resolution now, and obviously a, a sounding is is much better. Um, yeah, it's just it's it's one of the challenges of using a long term historical data set, unfortunately. Okay, thanks, guys. I, I understand. I was just curious if there was, you know, anything that was done in that realm. But I, I definitely understand what you guys are saying. I, I completely agree that it's going to be difficult, at least at this point. So, all right. But otherwise, yeah, great presentation. Thank you.
Well, very good. We're approaching and we're right at the one hour mark now. And uh, I would like to uh, thank everyone for joining us today and particularly Chris and Chris Chad and, and John and uh, for this and uh, hats off to uh, Dr. Graves also at St. Louis.